Coming up on American Black Journal, our Black Church in Detroit series takes a closer look at the church's really significant role in the community during the holiday season. We're going to talk about how the church provides relief to people who are dealing with financial issues and support for those struggling with grief at this time of the year. You don't want to miss this conversation. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm your host, Stephen Henderson, and as always, I'm really glad you've joined us. Today, we are continuing our series on the Black Church in Detroit, which is produced in partnership with the Ecumenical Theological Seminary and the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. The Black Church's role as a place where people can find hope during trying times is even more important during the holiday season. Although it's a time of great joy, the holidays can also bring a lot of pain. Many families are struggling to pay for food, and some are hurting due to the loss of loved ones. I spoke with Reverend Quantes Presley of Third New Hope Baptist Church, Dr. Portia Lockett, who is Director of Spiritual Care at the Detroit Medical Center, and Pastor Samil Thomas from City Covenant Church, about the many ways the Black Church helps those in need during the holidays. So this is a, a kind of strange conversation for me to have uh, this time of year, because I have to say, uh, the last three months of the year really are my favorites. Uh, I, I, I am always in such a great mood, and there are so many kind of high points in those three months, including my birthday, which is usually the week of Thanksgiving, that that I often don't think about all of the, the sort of flip side of that, maybe the hardship that some people uh, are enduring either because of money or or because of, of loss. Um, so I, I just want to start off with us just talking about how prominent that is, how much of that you see uh, in in your work. Um, Reverend Presley, I'll start with you. Oh, well, very much so. You know, I uh, always say that uh, Frankie Beverly and Mays tapped into their theological spirit uh, with that song, Joy and Pain, Sunshine and Rain, because often it is that close uh, for so many families in this season, while it's so much joy of being able to gather together. But uh, for many, there'll be empty seats at the table uh, which will really uh, cause, uh, you know, a continuation of them navigating grief uh, for their lost loved ones. And so uh, we take it as very important in this season to make sure that we create spaces and resources uh, for our congregation community. So here at Third New Hope, uh, we started this during the pandemic. We had a strolling memorial. Uh, where we had all of the pictures of those individuals that we lost throughout the year, and we invited the families to come through and to share as a moment of processing and this year, we've done the same with a memorial wall uh, that will remain up for the remainder of the year. Again, uh, encouraging uh, these families that we haven't forgotten about their loved ones and that we're still here with them uh, to journey with them through this season of sorrow. Um, uh, Pastor Thomas, um, this is a personal issue for you as well as a, a church issue. Talk about the things, not only that your congregation is confronting, but uh, the things that, that you are now confronting this time of year? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the community that we serve in Brightmore is probably one of the harder hit communities and could arguably be one of the poorest communities in the state of Michigan. 
And uh, this whole thing wrapped around poverty and around trauma and the challenges that we're dealing with is just overwhelming. There's several things that are happening uh, and some there's nothing we can do about. Just historically, I'm a, a baby boomer. I was born in 1960 and uh, my generation is going home to be with the Lord. Mm. That's just natural, that's just nature. The next 15, 20 years, we're going home, all right? And so that's just happening. On top of the carnage that's happening in our streets with the gun violence, and then the amount of trauma that people within our communities have served. And so uh, just two days ago, uh, I lost my nephew mm. uh, to suicide. Mm. And so his mother, uh, my sister passed on Good Friday and it was just devastating to him. He was just completely devastated. And uh, he started hearing voices. We tried to wrap around services for him. And uh, we buried her ashes at Myrtle Beach in the ocean. And so two days ago, he drove to Myrtle Beach and he drowned himself. Oh. And uh, you know, how do you so wrap sorry. you know, how do you wrap your head around that, right? 22 years old. And what it is is this, as Pastor was saying, Pastor Presley was saying so eloquently, it's this compound. You know what I mean? Okay, one thing on top of another thing on top of another thing. And um, you know, uh the pastor's um, wisdom to give people a place to process, mm -hmm. right? To process their grief and to be angry, all right? You know what I mean? And, um, and uh, again, this is, I, I'm with him. I, I love, or I'm with you, I love this season, mm. Stephen. I love uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I was a poor kid, but I didn't have much. But this is always my, <laughs> all right, you know, but to see the flip side that there are people who are not at the table. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so it's interesting to me that, that, you know, for you, this is a balancing, a balancing act then, right? You're trying to give yourself space and, and uh, deal with this unimaginable uh, amount of trauma, but, but you're also the pastor of a church where, you have to make that space for other people. I mean, that's that's an incredible burden. You know, it's something that the body of Christ, especially in the African-American church, has been doing from day one. The church was always that space. And uh, I mean, generations who had it way worse than us. All right, didn't have air conditioning, didn't have praise teams, didn't have all the fancy stuff that we have, mm -hmm. but they had the church. And it was a place that they could come and be prayed over, hands could be laid upon them. And so now we're at another stage. And so we are uh, embracing uh, behavioral health and making room for development center to come in and to do sessions and to teach people about anxiety and about depression, and those type of things. And then uh, empowering them to, um, to really acknowledge that we're going through. Not just the spiritual going through. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, but we're we're hearing voices or we're, we're, we're struggling with depression or whatever, and that this is a safe place, all right? The body of Christ, the church is a place where you can come, where we're setting a culture or an atmosphere where you can come. All right, and just be you, be authentic, and take the mask off. All right, and if we got to cry, we got to cry, we got to laugh, we got to laugh. All right, and it's kind of interesting for me because uh, I've been told I can't say we crazy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not politically correct, you know. All right, but man, when you look at what African Americans have been through, yeah, historically, yeah, and have uh, have bared. You know, they throw around the, uh, I don't want to monopolize, they throw around the term, we stand on the shoulders of others, but we really do. We really do, yeah. Well, Pastor Thomas, of course, I mean, I think all of us 
obviously feel the same way about the things that you're experiencing and, and hope the best for your family and your congregation, you know, as we get into the into the holidays. I, I, that's an unimaginable uh, amount of of sorrow and burden. Um, and so I think all of our prayers are are with you and your congregation and your family. Um, uh, Dr. Lockett, uh, your work is not in the church, but it is of the church. <laughs> and it's inspired uh, by the church. Talk about the things that that, that you see um, in your work environment that uh, that cry out for attention this time of the year. Absolutely. So um, as a director of uh, spiritual care and community affairs for the Detroit Medical Center, you know, we see uh, death and life um, simultaneously uh, every single day, you know, with a new mother coming in with the expectation of uh, delivering a full term baby only to find out that that baby is uh, uh, very unlikely to survive. And being able to have that conversation with that mother and with that father, um, letting them know that unfortunately you're in this situation and you still have to give birth to this unborn child that would no longer be living. So that's a whole different type of grief. And then when you go down the, um, uh, the path of the elderly community, you know, who we expect to get to end of life when they're 80 and 90 and maybe even 100 years of age that have come to that space. But now, as you said before, we are seeing so many people who are um, in that, that space of the 45 to 55 year old individuals who have not uh, been listening to their bodies. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation with someone the other day that you have to be in touch with your tempo because when you don't listen to your tempo, guess what? Your temple will do whatever it wants to do. And sometimes that temple will allow you to be taken out. So we have to really pay attention um, to that. There are so many people um, who are experiencing grief on so many different levels. When we, when we come to the place of worship, we, we would typically go with the matriarchs of our family and the patriarchs of our family. And sometimes uh, those right now because of COVID and just because of life in general, a lot of those individuals are no longer at the table. They're no longer the ones who are grabbing the grab grandchildren um, and even the sons and daughters, you know, into that place of worship. And even once we get to that place of worship, um, you know, times have just shifted and just changed. So many doors are not even open right now because of COVID. And so like one of the ministers said earlier, we have, have shifted and we're trying to transition and making sure that we are welcoming anyone who wants to come through the doors of the church. But with that being said, we have to make sure that those individuals that are on the welcoming team are trained mm -hmm. to be able to see when there's someone who is having a challenge. I'm a, a very uh, uh, active part of the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network and the faith community there. And they do a wonderful job of training faith leaders. I just attended a seminar not too long ago about suicide prevention. What are some things that we need to look out for when we see um, those individuals that walk through our doors and, and not um, uh, making them feel unwelcome because of their behavior and how they're dressed and how they smell? You know, the word of God says, you know, come you know, let, let them come, come as you are. So they're coming as they are, but we have to make sure that we are welcoming those individuals in that space yeah. and that safe space yeah. without being judged. Uh, Dr. Lockett, you also are balancing the professional with the personal uh, this year. Uh, talk about how, how that works for you. Yeah. So, you know, my son uh, received his wings through gun violence in December of, of 2020. So it's coming up on 20 years, I mean, on uh, uh, two years that that's taken place. And um, for me, I had to step, I had to take a step back because I deal with that every single day. And so I had to take care of me because if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of anyone else. So I had to take a few months off and go into that therapeutic space to make sure that I was equipped spiritually, mentally, and emotionally to go back out and make the impact that I make in other lives. Uh, one of the things that I, I started uh, just September the 9th, which would have been his 30th birthday, we started the Azel Benet Lockett Foundation. We're here to help you heal, offer you hope, and hold your heart as you're going through that grief 
grieving journey. And that grieving journey doesn't always necessarily have to look like the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. It could be the loss of a lifestyle, losing um, um, an, a, a, a ligament, um, losing a home, losing a relationship. There's so many different ways that we uh, lose you know, in the, in this space, losing a pet, you know, some people de-emphasize, you know, the loss of a pet when that furry animal is, is that is part of that family. And so some people go through um, that, that grieving journey because the loss of a pet, the loss of a neighbor. I mean, we have just um, amplified the way grief looks. And, and nowadays, you know, you, 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 you're given that two week period to grieve because it's like, I, I, do her, do believe her name is Alexandra Grande has a song out that says, thank you next. Mm -hmm. So you got that two week window that says, okay, we've given you, we've, we've served you your chicken dinner and we sent you a couple of cards through you a couple of dollars. Okay. Thank you next, because we've got to get on to the next person. And we have to make sure that we're giving people time mm. to grieve and not putting a time limit on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Presley, I mean, that, that reminds me of, of, the sort of sustaining work, I guess, that the church has to do here. I mean, we're talking about the holidays, and that's a particularly tough time for folks. Uh, but the church always is called to this space. And because uh, of the things that we experience as African Americans, not just in Detroit, but but all over the country, um, the need is always the need is always there. And so the demand uh, on the church is always kind of at a high level. No, very much so. And I'm blessed here at Third New Hope because uh, we have a significant amount of uh, licensed counselors and therapists who are also members of our congregation. And as a result, we started a ministry called Seasons of Grace, uh, which provides people an opportunity to access these counselors in order to process the grief that they're experiencing. And so we uh, situated the month of October as our mental health awareness month. And we even had uh, settings for uh, our youth and children uh, to be able to process as well, because along lines of the uh, items of uh, loss uh, that Dr. Lockett mentioned, divorce, uh, family separations are things that children are having to encounter, particularly in this holiday season, uh, that we want to make sure that we're providing them the resource to uh, think through uh, and to find healthy ways to uh, navigate uh, the challenges in which they're experiencing. And so it is a you know constant and persistent a need uh, in our community, and we're trying to find ways to be able to meet that need. And so again, uh, for us, uh, you know, I come to the point having done uh, enough of these funeral services to uh, realize that we don't do them quite well mm -hmm. uh, if with the five or six stages of grief, depending upon uh, which one you uh, ascend to. Uh, oftentimes, people are still in the state of denial uh, at the moment of the funeral service. And mm -hmm. That's when we believe that they receive closure, but the real hit of grief doesn't occur until months or uh, weeks later. Uh, and at that point, people have moved on. Uh, many of their friends and the like are back to their regularly uh, scheduled programs. And so that's really when the church uh, has to step in and to provide that support system uh, to help them to know that it does indeed take time. And that's a part of the motivation uh, between our uh, for our memorial uh, kind of uh, presentations, uh, because again, some of the faces that are on the wall, uh, they passed uh, November, December last year, they passed mm -hmm. in February or March, but we are helping these families to recognize that while others may have moved on, we haven't forgotten that you're still uh, trying to adjust to this new normal. And we want you to know that we're here with and for you. And so uh, churches have played this role. Uh, oftentimes it may have gone overlooked and, and uh, taken for granted, but I think the numbers of families uh, who have gotten that phone call, that card in the mail, uh, that uh, invitation to their family dinners, knowing that that person is now uh, without their family, that has, again, uh, created that beloved community that lets them know that they're not in this by themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Pastor Thomas, I want to talk a little more about money um, and the financial strain of this, uh, not just this time of year, but, but you know, all year. You you minister in in Brightmore, which I always um, marvel at at how much um, how much is asked of you and how much uh, how much people in that community still need. Um, talk about this time of year, though, and the way you try to meet those financial needs that that people have. You know, we've got a dual approach. You know, I was looking at this thing when uh, I. 
charity to change, charity to change. And so, you know, on one side, I don't want to foster dependency. I want to empower people. And so I, I make sure that I let them know, first of all, Christmas comes around the same time every year. Mm -hmm. All right. And we have to become better stewards over what we've been given. And there, there are um, soul food industry based of us, us taking a little and making it into a delicacy. Mm -hmm. All right. We have an art of doing that. And that uh, we have to learn about financial literacy. We have to learn how to invest and how to save, how to, you know, five years ago, you could have bought houses in Brightmore for $500, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's one part. One part is me trying to empower and, and try to reframe the, uh, their thinking, their paradigm, that there is, there is money in the hood. It's what we putting it on. It's what do we do with it, right? Right. What are we spending it on? All right. You know, and so we're not as poor. I've been to Africa. I've been <laughs> to the shanty towns. But we're not as poor as we think we are. Mm. All right. In America, you know, that's a whole different thing. Then the other side is the real need. All right. You know, in Brightmoor, we have a significant portion of people who are homeless. And they're uh, unhoused. They're living in abandoned homes. Mm -hmm. No running water, no utilities. All right. And so when we first started feeding people, we thought we'd get 30, 40 people. And we're up to 200 people a day. Mm. Wow. All right. We're doing 200 meals a day, four days a week. All right. And then inflation. You know, to a person that's doing well, to the middle class and the upper middle class, inflation, it affects everyone. <laughs> But to the poor, it hits straight to the core. All right, you know, so I was watching a brother the other day who had a Yukon. He had an older Yukon at the gas station putting almost $100 worth of gas. In the tank, yeah. His tank. Now, I'm sure when he bought that Yukon, he thought it was, <laughs> he thought it was a good deal. <laughs> but now he doesn't think it's a good deal. We laughed and joked at the, at the pump, but... It is causing people to make very, very serious decisions that some of them were already making, but just making from a deeper standpoint. Yeah. So we try to do a dualism, if you will, uh, to hold people accountable, all right, but also to represent in a manner that gives them respect. And if you're if you need, that's what the church is here for. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I would love to continue this conversation with the three of you, I think, for hours and hours, uh, but we are uh, out of time. Uh, I really appreciate all of you being here to talk about uh, these challenges and talk about how in your work uh, you meet them. But I mostly want to say, look, let's have uh, a good holiday season, uh, all of us uh, and, and all of your congregations and the people that you work with, uh, there is still joy to be had this yeah. time of year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having us. That's it for us this week. You can find out more about today's guests and view all of the Black Church in Detroit episodes at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can connect with us anytime on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Delta faucets to bare paint. Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by 
Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.